Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Tani Schwartz Herman. Um, so pleased to welcome you to our Monday webinar series um, relating to God. Um, I want to welcome any first time. Uh, I want to welcome any um, first time attendees to the Monday webinar series. Um, our the topic for this series is um, watering the soul in times of faith and doubt uh, with Rabbi Michal Springer, Manager of Clinical Pastoral Education at New York Presbyterian Hospital in New York City and Adjunct Professor at JTS. If you're feeling inspired by this opportunity to learn with JTS's outstanding scholars, we invite you to partner with us by sponsoring a learning session. We have three sponsorship levels, Chacham for $540, Tzadik for 1,000 and Navi for $1,800. Uh, to learn more, please contact learninglives at jtsa.edu. Um, just to go over the how we'll do the, the Q&A for today's session, um, Rabbi Springer will pause for questions periodically throughout the class. Um, we'll also have a Q&A period at the end. Um, you can use your chat, your chat feature to submit your questions to uh, myself, um, during the Q&A period, I'll select a few of the questions to, pre to present to Rabbi Springer. Um, as I mentioned last week, um, for those of you that were with us, um, Rabbi Andelman um, has, has had COVID um, and she's still recovering. Um, so she, um, so we're, we're just, I'm gonna be moderating the session today. Uh, for any technical or logistical questions, um, please initiate a private chat with Lynn Feynman. Um, the sources for today's class were in the email that you received uh, with the Zoom link for the session this morning. Uh, we'll be screen sharing them as well. Um, pleased to introduce um, Rabbi Michal Springer. Uh, Rabbi Springer is the manager of clinical pastoral education at New York Presbyterian Hospital and an adjunct professor at JTS. She founded the Center for Pastoral Education at JTS in 2009. Rabbi Springer was the first conservative rabbi to be certified as an educator by the Association for Clinical Pastoral Education. Her publications include Sisters in Mourning, Daughters Reflecting on Carrot Loss and Meaning with Dr. Su Young Pak. Um, and we're, we're so pleased to have her teaching for us today. Um, in just a minute, I'm gonna turn it over to Rabbi Springer. Okay, and if you'll, we're having a slight technical difficulty, so if you'll just uh, just give us a minute, we're going to figure that out. Although, uh, here we are. Okay, so today's session is watering the soul in times of faith and doubt. And I'm gonna share my screen with you. Um, okay. Um, so any series that's talking about faith is asking us to be personal um, because our faith lives are very personal to us. And I'm gonna walk you through some of how I approach faith and some of what I wrestle with um, and give you an opportunity to engage with me in some dialogue. Is everybody okay hearing me and seeing me? All right, I was thrown for a loop. So, so nice to see your faces. The first verse that I have here is from Isaiah. Yichyu matecha nevelati yikumun, akitsu verananu shochne afar, kital orot talecha, the aretz nefaim tapil. Oh, let your dead revive, let corpses arise. Awake and shout for joy, you who dwell in the dust. For your dew is like the dew on fresh growth. You make the land of the shades come to life. So I start here because when I think about what I've wrestled with the most in terms of faith, 
for me, it comes down to this. Triatamitim, the revival of the dead, something beyond this life, believing that this life is not all there is and that there is life that follows, whether it's in the form of an embodied existence in the literal bringing bodies out from the grave or other forms of life after death. So in the, the verse from Isaiah that is, that is hoping for this revival, it paints a picture that um, is full of the joy of the resurrection. And a lot of people don't think of Judaism as really focusing on resurrection and life after death. But it's very much in our texts in one form or another, and you see it here in Isaiah. And I figure I'm going to start with where my heart is. Um, so for me, belief is never theoretical. It always needs to be embodied. And when I get stuck, I need to start paying attention and playing and looking at various sources that help me get unstuck. And um, the world of pastoral care has been so helpful to me in helping me get unstuck here. And I'm going to take you on my journey. So in this first verse, this phrase, tal orot talecha, the, the dew of the light is your dew. There's an organization in Tzfat in Israel called Tal Orot. It's, one of, it's a mystical organization. And this idea of Tal Orot is the illuminating flow of divine mind that infuses collective human consciousness. That's the mystical reading of this dew of lights. So here we have um, a, a verse that could be understood very literally in terms of the way that the dead come up and um, the dew is manifest. The dew is connected to God's illumination. We're gonna look at a lot of different texts that have to do with the dew and the rain and the way that this uh, resurrection gets embodied here. One thing that we know is that when this dew is manifest and when this revival happens, we are full of joy. So uh, there are lots of ways of being in the dust. There's the being in the dust when we're dead, when our bodies are under the ground, and there's the being in the dust of depression and the darkness that we can experience. So this, this question about resurrection is both about bodily resurrection and what literally happens to us after we die. And it's also about the kinds of resurrection that happen in life. I find that they're all intermingled. So I wanna take you down to the next text. This is from the Sidur. It's part of our daily liturgy that we recite three times a day. And this is where I was first introduced to the anxiety about Tchiat HaMetim, the revival of the dead. So we read, you are mighty forever, O Lord. You revive the dead. You are mighty to save. And then, depending on the season, we have two different things that we say. So in the summertime, we say, Morid Hatal, you bring down the dew. And in the wintertime, going from Sukkot until Pesach, we say, Mashiv Haruach Umorid Hagashem. We cause the wind to blow and the rain to descend. And then we continue. You sustain the living with loving kindness. You revive the dead to life with great mercy. You support the fallen and you heal the sick. You free the captives and preserve your faith with those who sleep in the dust. Who is like you, master of mighty deeds? Who can be compared to you, O king, who causes death and restores life and causes your salvation to sprout? And then at the end, you are faithful to restore the dead to life. Blessed are you, O Lord, who brings life to the dead. 
So I grew up in a combination of the reform and conservative movements. I went to um, a Solomon Schechter school that was affiliated with the conservative movement. And I attended a reform synagogue uh, called a temple in Boston, Temple Israel. And at Temple Israel, the reform prayer book says, Mechaye Hako, who gives life to everything. And so I was very aware of this theological debate that was going on between the movements. Would we assert in our liturgy that God brings life to the dead? Or would we go with a more generic Mechaye Hako? And is it enough to say that God gives life to everything? Or must we say that God gives life to the dead? And I think that because I was moving between these two movements and my liturgy kept changing, it made me very conscious of what I was saying and why I was saying it. And when I wound up at JTS for rabbinical school, I realized that I had a hankering to say Mechaye HaMetim who gives life to the dead. And I didn't know if I really meant it. And there's a lot in the liturgy that, that might wash over us and we might say, we don't have to mean it exactly in the way that it's said, but as somebody who was studying to be a rabbi, I really got focused here. What would it mean to say that God gives life to the dead? How, how could that be true for me? This became particularly important when I started working in the hospital and I started working with dying people. And the people who were dying cared very much as they would sometimes ask me, what happens after I die? Is there life after I die? And not just Christian people who would often have a lot of faith and certainty about the afterlife, but a lot of Jews who were facing their own death and would want to know what comes next in a terrifying moment of transition. And it caused me tremendous anxiety not to be able to say, yes, I have faith that there is life after this life. I realized that I wanted to be able to say that, that the people I was with sometimes desperately wanted me to say that to them. They wanted me, they wanted to be able to follow along with me and my being able to say that. And I needed to be authentic and say that actually I, I didn't know. And that not knowing caused me suffering. I was talking about this with my husband as I was preparing for this talk today. And he said, you know, I, he was with me at that time. And he said, I didn't really realize how much you struggled with this. And maybe some of you struggle with this too. Um, it's not something that I would talk about daily, but the proximity to dying kept it alive for me, that I needed to be honest about what faith was possible for me. And I didn't want to be in a place of not believing this because I felt that it would give me comfort as I witnessed with some of my patients who did believe it. So I'll, I'll tell you what the journey that I've been on with this. The first thing that catches my attention is in this, in this um, second bracha of the Amidah, the big paragraph, the Dalit, the number four, says, you sustain the living with loving kindness. And after it says, rabim, you revive the dead with great mercy. The next phrase is, somech naflim, you support the fallen. And after that comes, you heal the sick, you free the captives. These phrases are all opposites that are being held together. The ones who have fallen are being sustained, are being kept up. The ones who are sick are being healed. The ones who are captive are being freed. And so is another one of these paradoxes, death and life, just like the freeing of the captive, the freedom and the captivity are held together in the divine, death and life are held together in the divine. 
this for me has been a transformative understanding that, that carries me spiritually. It's not about something abstract that I have to believe. It's actually the experience of opposites being able to be held together. That's what a faith life is for me. Opposites being held together. So what would it mean for me to be able to embrace Mechaye Hametim, gives life to the dead, life and death held together. The way that I could start to tease this apart was through the imagery of our tradition that helps us understand what this life to the dead is all about. And we have a, a great hint and pathway forward in this bracha. As I said before, in the summer, we say Morit Hatal, who brings down the dew. And in the winter, Mashiv Haruach, and it's a, it's a stormy day today here in New York, and brings down the, the winds flow and brings down the rain. So there's something about rain and dew and resurrection that gets articulated here. Now, for those of you who are regular shulgars, you know that what looks like a little bit of a line here, a, a kind of buried line on Sukkot, on Shemini Atzeret, the, the eighth day, and on the first day of Pesach, these little lines blossom into big liturgical events. And they become the, the prayer for Geshem and the prayer for Tal. Um, which are sublime liturgical poetry. So I, in my computer in my office, which I had to vacate so that I could actually, you could hear me um, and see me, I had a copy of this from the Sim Shalom Sidur, from the, uh, sorry, from the Lev Shalom Sidur. And, um, but here on the page, I only have the English here. So I'm just going to go through it with you in the English. So for Geshem, which is the prayer that we recite um, at, on Shmini Atzeret. All of the major figures, our, our ancestors, all have encounters with Geshem, with rain. And we bring them together so that we understand that when we're calling on rain, we're calling on generations and generations who have engaged with the divine through the blessing of rain. So the first paragraph that I have here is um, about Abraham. Oh God and God of our ancestors, remember the patriarch who was drawn to you like water. So we think about Abraham leaving everything he knows to follow God like water, drawn to God like water, thirsty for God. You blessed him as a tree planted amid flowing waters. You protected and saved him when he went through fire and water. The Midrash says that he was in the fiery furnace of King Nimrod, and he was almost drowned on the way to Akedat Yitzchak, the binding of Isaac. You loved him as he sowed righteousness upon all the world's waters. For his sake, do not withhold water. That's Avraham Avinu, Abraham. And then, traditionally, we would go to Isaac, but in what I love is that there's a, there's a new version that, that interpolates the um, matriarchs as well. So we're not gonna go through all of the paragraphs, but in this next stanza, remember the barren woman who had compassion for those who needed a drink of water. That would be Imenu Sara. She remained pure in the land fed by flowing waters, brought countless women to dwell in the shade of the one who separated the upper and lower waters back to creation and suckled many babies when her milk flowed like water, which is an incredible image for someone who was barren for so long that her milk flowed like water. For her sake, do not withhold water. Now, one of the things that I love about this stanza is this line, she remained pure in the land fed by flowing waters. So you, you may remember the, the two times that Abraham and Sarah go down to they go down, they leave the land of Israel. And one time they go down to Egypt and there she, she was, is taken by Pharaoh, but she doesn't have sex with him. Abraham says she's his sister, but she remains pure. But the piece that I wanna focus on here is that it's a land 
fed by flowing waters. So that's the Nile. The Nile is the, the water in Egypt and the land of Egypt is irrigated by the water that comes up from the Nile and overflows on the banks. So if you've ever been to Egypt or if you have a good sense of the topography of Egypt, you know that those swaths of land along the Nile are very fertile. And then if you go more inland away from the Nile, then you come into desert. Now you have the technology to bring it out further. But everything in Egypt was based on the overflowing of the Nile, as opposed to the land of Israel that has always been dependent on rain and the dew, which comes from God. And so we have two archetypes here. We have the land where that depends on a river that's always overflowing and is not tied into the kind of vulnerability that we feel in the land of Israel, even today, as we need the rain and the dew to come and make the land fertile. Um, the next one is Isaac. Remember the one whose birth was foretold by those who were offered water. Those are the angels. They're the same angels, God, who shows up um, to Abraham uh, and Sarah, and they rush to take care of them. You instructed his parents to spill his blood like water. So that is the Akedah, the binding of Isaac. He too learns to pour out his heart like water. That is when he's praying for Rebecca to be able to become pregnant and give birth. Later, he dug wells and found springs of water for the sake of his righteousness, grant the gift of flowing water. Now, the last one that I want to read to you, I, I put the wrong verse in uh, stanza in here. So I'm going to read it to you from, you'll just have to listen. Remember the prophet who watched over her brother by standing at the edge of the water. So that's Miriam at the Nile watching Moses as he's in that basket. The shepherd who led his people between the two mounds of water. That's Moses at the crossing of the sea. And the priest dedicated with flood, with blood and water, that's Aaron. For the sake of these three, the nation merited the pillar of fire, the cloud and the well of water. For the sake of their righteousness, grant the gift of flowing water. So um, I don't know if all of you are familiar with the Midrash of the well of Miriam. But it's one of my favorite midrashim that when we were in the desert and we had no water and in the desert, the water wasn't going to fall the way that it does in the land of Israel. Miriam had a well that followed the people around in the desert and provided them with water, which is why when she died, they cried out that there was no water because Miriam's well was no longer with them. So if I, if I shift from thinking about people being resurrected to the kind of rebirth that happens with water, I find that I can begin to relax. Water is our gift. Our ancestors secured this water for us. We are made out of water. Our bodies are made out of water. And if we can rely on this gift of water and this theme of water that has been with us from the most ancient times until today, then we know that there is something that we can turn towards in recognizing in this world, this gift of divine um, parch, thirst, quenching our, our parchedness, quenching our thirst. And that is the triat hametim that we experience all the time when we are depleted and we can't go on and we drink water or we experience the rainfall and everything that has wilted comes back to life. I find that this image helps me, helps prepare the ground for me to embrace the possibilities of resurrection that I have found so challenging. So I want to stick, stick with water a little bit more and then I'll, I'll take a break in a little bit. So in, in Tanit, in the Talmud, 
Rabbi Yochanan said there are three keys maintained in the hand of the Holy One, blessed be God, which were not transmitted to an, our inter, to an intermediary. And they are the key of rain, the key of birthing, and the key of the resurrection of the dead. The key of rain, as it is stated, the Lord will open for you his good treasure, the heavens, to give the rain of your land in its due time. That's from Deuteronomy. From where is it derived that the key of birthing is maintained by God as it is written, and God remembered Rachel and listened to her, and he opened her womb? From where is it derived the key of the resurrection of the dead is maintained by God as it is written, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves from Ezekiel. So why is why are these keys? You have to know the Hebrew here. Ve'elu hen mafteach. Mafteach that opens. So in each of these verses, we, we hear Vayiftach Adonai et otro hatov et hashamayim. God opens. So if you're using, if you're opening in all of these, the verb that is used is that God opens. So how does that happen? It happens with a key. And what, which are the three keys? So the three keys are the key of rain, the key of birthing, and the key of resurrection of the dead. These are all liminal experiences in life. The, the coming of the rain, which we can't control. Here is Rachel, desperate to be a mother, God opening her womb. Again, fertility, which we cannot control. And the passage from Ezekiel is the dry bones, that God brings these dry bones back to life through the resurrection, the opening of those graves. And my breath into you, I will put my breath into you, God says in Ezekiel, and you shall live again. So we are seeing that this connection between rain and resurrection is starting to accumulate in our various sources. And um, I want to share one more with you. I'm going to go through this one rather quickly. It's long. Um, but let me say that if you haven't encountered Choni Amagel, Choni is the circle maker, and he is a folk hero in the Talmud who has a very intimate relationship with God. I think of this um, being like kind of a Goldilocks story. So the people sent a message to Choni Amagel, and they said, it's already past Adar, we're getting towards spring, we're getting towards the dry season and it still hasn't rained. And they say to him, pray that the rain will fall. So he prayed and no rain fell. And he drew a circle in the dust and stood inside it in the manner that the prophet Habakkuk did and says, I'm going to stay here until God makes it rain. And then he took an oath that he's not gonna leave until God makes it rain. So the rain trickled down but only in small droplets. And his students said to him, well, that's just enough to release you from your vow. That's not really rain. So then Choni prays again. And this time the rain pours down furiously, each drop as big as the mouth of a barrel. The sages estimated that no drop was less than a log. His students said to him, Rabbi, we have seen that you can call on God to perform miracles and we will not die. But now it appears to us that rain is falling only to destroy the world. So Choni is wrestling with this. Now it's, he's got this, this abundance of water. The whole point about the, the balance of the waters is that it has to be in good balance. And so finally, Choni prays again and tells God that it can't be more than the people can bear and it can't be less than the people can bear. So here, if you're, are you seeing my cursor? You grew angry with them and withheld rain and they are unable to bear it. You also bestowed upon them too much good and they were also unable to bear it. So Khan is asking for quite a lot, the balance of the rain. So life is held in this balance. We need God to, to give us enough, but not too much. And then finally, at the very end, um, there's this very interesting depiction of Choni in his relationship to God. It says, you nag God and God does your bidding like a son who nags his father and his father does his bidding. 
And the son says to his father, father, take me to be bathed in hot water. Take, wash me with cold water. Give me nuts, almonds, peaches, pomegranates. And his father gives him. And about you, the verse states, your father and mother will be glad and she who bore you will rejoice. Somehow, Choni is in this special category of intimacy with God. And the story shows about the, the delicacy of, of needing life in balance and the way that water has to be kept in balance. And I think it also engenders, at least in me, a kind of um, envy that Choni can be in this dialogue, can, can, pour, can pray to God and God gives the water. We don't live in a world that looks quite like that. We live in a world where the keys can feel hidden, where the vulnerability can be overwhelming. And we still pour out our desire to God. I wanna share one more text with you, which is a text also from Tani and it's offered in contrast. So unlike Choni who makes a big show in public, here, everything that happens in the, in the praying for the rain, and the um, desire for God to enable life to be possible happens in private. The powerful men of Israel, such as Rabbi Yonah, the father of Rabbi Mani, acted differently. When the world was in need of rain, he enters his house and says to his household, give me my sack and I will go and buy myself a dinner of grain. When he went outside, he went and stood in a low place, as it is written, out of the depths I have called to you, O Lord. And he would stand in a secluded place and cover himself with sackcloth and pray for mercy and rain would come. When he would come home, they would say to him, did the master bring grain? He said to them, I said to myself, since rain has now come, there will be relief in the world and there will be grain and there will be life. And so what we see in this passage is the, the link between repentance and asking God for mercy and the possibilities of the rain that falls that makes life sustainable. So I, I think of all of these images as being the images of how we approach God when life is hanging in the balance, when we are overwhelmed by the possibility that there is only life in this world and are wrestling perhaps with the possibility of an eternal life, a life in a next world, a life that follows death, making death only a temporary situation and the everlasting, the promise of everlasting life um, being real. Um, so I wanna, all right, I'm just gonna read you one more then I'm gonna pause. In Psikta de Rav Kahana, we are taught who is the, who is it whose prayer goes up to heaven and brings down rain? The person who distributes tithes with his fistfuls. He causes the dew and rain to come down to the world. Who is it whose prayer does not go up to heaven and does not bring down the rain? The one who does not distribute tithes with his fistfuls. He stops the heaven from bringing down dew and rain to the world. Now I included this Psikta de Rav Kana because this is, this is the promise that I really gravitated towards um, in my younger years in wanting the order that this passage promises that when we do the appropriate thing, the good things will happen. And when we do bad things, that bad things will follow. But we know that we live in a world where there is plenty of chaos. And so the, the way that this passage is um, promising us that it will make sense, we have to be able to tolerate when it doesn't make sense. And that brings me back to this desire to reconcile in some way with with something that comes after this life. So before I break for our first chance for you to weigh in here, I wanna just share with you that what, what shifted things for me was making space for a lot of different images, images like the crazy honey image, images of the world as it is with the rains not coming and the uncertainty there and needing God to use that key to open up things that were blocked and being with people who are suffering and people who are dying, who are asking what is going to come 
to me. So I want to share two images with you. When I was in the hospital one day, I had the honor of being with somebody who died. And I sat with this person and they died while I was with them. And I continued to sit with them after they died, reading the Psalms. And I felt their presence lingering. Now, that may seem odd to you, but one of the reasons that we understand that there are different stages of mourning is because the soul lingers and leaves gradually in our tradition because the soul is very attached to the body and doesn't want to go so quickly. And sitting with this person, I felt that soul lingering. It's not something that I have felt very often, but having felt at that time, it made me stop my certainty of something not being happening after death and open me to, okay, this is something I don't understand, but something that I've experienced. And when my father died and I sat next to his coffin, reciting to Helim as his doing Shmira, I again had an experience of my father coming and being with me. So I can't tell you what that was, but I can tell you that it pushed back the part of me that wanted rational answers and enabled me to say, this is something that has been in our tradition a very long time. And I am open to it. I am open to it. And over time, as I remained open to this teaching, I got to a place where I realized that I was ready to say, I embrace this. I embrace a life that comes after death. I can't explain it to you. I can't prove it to you, but I can invoke it through the teachings and offer it to you as something that no longer plagues me in the same way after many years. And it was being with people who are dying and feeling them in proximity that I had to say, I need to be honest about the experiences I've had and let them stand with me and let these teachings sing in the ways that they want to, reassuring me that there is an eternal quality, a life that comes even with death holding together the opposites. I'm going to stop here and Tani's going to do some moderating for us. <clears throat> well, I just wanted to comment on the faith of our adult learning crowd here who stuck with us through 20 minutes of uh, technical difficulties, which as you know, is not our way. So I want to thank everyone <clears throat> for being here and sticking with it. <clears throat> I just wanted to make sure that um, that I fully understood what you were saying, Rabbi Springer, um, about the connection to water. Uh, so I think I think the connection you were making was um, first of all, it's just about about the blessing itself. That you're um, you're not just reading it metaphorically, but you sort of came to a place where there's some way in which you can understand you can take it to be literal, um, even without a firm understanding of what that means. And, um, and the connection to water, was that about kind of the, the, the constancy of the water? Could you just make that connection explicit again? So part of it has to do with the fact that we are made of water. Over 80% of a human being is made of water. And yet we, and so we, we are both made of water and depend on water. So if we go back to the, the imagery of the Nile versus being in the land of Israel, that the Nile is a body of water that's always there that just needs to overflow. But that's not where our spirituality comes from. We, our spirituality comes from needing the rain to fall. 
and, and the vulnerability of needing that rain to fall. And the way that when the rain falls, if, if, you've, been, if you've ever been in Israel, when there's been a flash flood, a shitafon, suddenly all the flowers bloom. And they were kind of there, but they were kind of not there until the water comes and then suddenly everything is alive. And so that image of a kind of death that happens within the absence of the water and the water making life come, that having a sensitivity to the way in which water revives the dead is the same, it's a way of seeing that there is a death that is, that we can be looking at the death, but inherent inside of it is the possibility of life. And as much as I love rain, I love dew even more. We're gonna head into the dew in a moment because the dew is even more subtle than the rain. So Choni has these big buckets of water and it talks about, and, and talks about how God can punish us with a lot of rain or God can punish us without any rain that rain can be seen as this way of God communicating with us about the possibilities of life and death, because we know how dependent we are on water as the source of life, monitored by the, the keys that are in God's hand. It is the key for the rain and the key for the birth and the key for the resurrection. That's really helpful, thank you. Um, you know, one of the things that's, that's beautiful about the um, the prayer for rain that you shared, it, it really in keeping with what you were just saying is that right, water plays a different role in each of those stories. I think that's part of what you're, you're talking about, right? In sort of unexpected ways, it sustains us and, um, and saves us. So there was a question um, or a comment noting that in that prayer for rain, it doesn't actually refer to rain, to Geshem, it refers to water. Um, and the person was musing, maybe that's Maybe that's, um, you know, like in, in Egypt, the Nile, the Nile sustained people through water, but in Israel, they were dependent on rain. Um, but I think it's, it, I think it's more of a, it's more than a technical question, actually. It's really sort of noting um, sustenance can come from different directions <laughs> that you may not expect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, yeah, and one of the things I also love there is that that milk turns into water, right? So the milk and the water are seen that they it flows like water, and blood and water. That um, again, we're very connected to blood as the life force. But seeing that water is also the life force, the two of them are hand in hand, and so that the pouring out of our heart and the, the, that image of um, going to sacrifice Isaac, which is the, the letting of that blood. Um, and when he, when Isaac is praying, God, Isaac pours out his heart. Um, so the, the pouring out of his heart in prayer and the blood and the water all mingling together in that flow, the life force that's contained in each of them. So there was a question about, um, earlier in the in the paragraph in the in the Sidur, the prayer book, um, the other those other statements about God um, raising the fallen and healing the sick, which are maybe easier to understand uh, literally. And yet there are obviously many cases where God doesn't do that. So I mean it, I guess it's sort of a classic um, problem of evil or theodicy question that um, that one of our participants here raised right that so the the idea I mean take take healing the sick um, or e any of those any of those praises of God that they can inspire faith and they can also when they happen and they can also cut down faith when they don't happen yeah so when when I read this when I talk about it as the resolving of paradox in God holding both, that helps me not focus on sickness and healing. Sickness as a problem, healing as the response. Because when we do that, we can often say, well, there was no response, there was no healing. But if we're holding them together, then the, the illness and the healing are um, partners. We have to go through the illness 
with a, a sensitivity to opportunities for healing even inside of the illness so that and maybe this ties it back with the um team with the resurrection that um that the the death that comes doesn't annihilate the life that was because there is a life even in the death in some form so the the being held captive and the experiencing freedom that our task as human beings is to experience the divine weaving together of freedom even in captivity of healing even in illness of being lifted up even in being brought low and and that's ultimately what what frees me in this faith conundrum of how how is there death in life after life that the opposites are not actually opposites, they're pairs that have to be held together. And I think that by reciting these words regularly, we train ourselves, they become these phrases, they go together. So the healer and the sick, they go together. And if in our lives we're experiencing illness and we're asking, where is God? Then we have to know that wherever there is illness, the divine is there. That's beautiful. Um, a, a lot of people have made comments about sort of a continuum, continuum of of um, before life and during life and after life, um, and just various um, various ways of expressing that continuum. Um, I think that it's each of the, each of these things is sort of is wrapped up is wrapped up in its opposite and we can experience one within the other. It's so beautiful. Um, we have more questions, but do you want to continue with your test? Why don't we take one more? Okay. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> you know what I think, I think, the, I think the other ones sort of that have come in, they're more comments and they would take them, take us more in different directions. Well, here, here's sort of a basic question, which I think, I think you can answer easily, but um, one person was asking, what's the connection between the resurrection and this, this section of the Amidah, this um, Gevura, just sort of what, what's it doing here in this, um, in this blessing? Well, the first blessing of the Amidah connects us with the abundant blessings that come to us because of our ancestors. And this blessing in God's Gvura, the, the, the greatest demonstration of God's might is God's being in charge of life and death and reconciling that death is not a permanent um, state but is also bound up with life, that there is life in death. Um, so that, and that's where, all, that's where what I was just saying before about the opposites being held together happens. That is God's might. God is mighty in reconciling what seems like the impossibility of, of things that can't be reconciled are reconciled in the divine. So if, if the first thing we do as we come into prayer with God is we, recognize that there is an abundance of blessing that comes to us, even though we might not have merit. The, our ancestors had a lot of merit that spills over into us. In the second blessing, we are encountering God's tremendous power, which is the power of having the paradox be resolved through holding both, the God who is all. And so ultimately, I didn't want to say Mikhaye Hakol, who, make, who gives life to everything, because it was said in opposition to who gives life to the dead. And where my faith life wanted to be was in understanding what it could mean to have life in death. So for me, that, that's what I yearned for. And I think that this second bracha of the Amidah is, is inviting us to stretch, to find what that can mean for each of us. That's beautiful. You know, you remind me of a section of the liturgy where we in the conservative prayer book have made a change to the biblical text where um in the morning we say we say that god is a say shalom that god 
makes peace and creates everything. We see that, um, you know, sort of our focus on creation in the morning, whereas the biblical text that it's drawn from, as I'm sure you know, is the Shalom Vorei Ra, that God makes peace and, and creates evil, um, which I, I think is, but that's really what you're talking about, the holding both and understanding that God is both and life is both. And we've we've sanitized it a little bit there for various reasons, but um, sort of a, a biblical antecedent of what you're saying. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so I think that puts us in a great place to go into the last two texts that I brought to you. One is a poem by Yaakov HaKohen, who was a Jewish mystic who was active in the mid 13th century in Castile and Provence. And I've only brought it to you in the English, I apologize. May the name send its hidden radiance to open the gates of deliverance to his servants and shine in their hearts, which now are shut in silent darkness. May the great king be moved to act in perfection and righteousness to open the gates of wisdom for us and waken the love of old, the love of ancient days. So we have here our gates. Um, and whenever we're standing in front of the gates, we're, we're praying for those gates to open. And the gates are gates between us and God that are on gates on God's side and the gates that are in our own, our own ways of being walled off, which is in our hearts, that our, our hearts can be shut. So they are shut in silent darkness. So we're asking God to open the gates the gates of deliverance, the gates of wisdom, and waken the love of old, the love of the ancient days. So the mystical tradition is really about seeking one another. And I think that for me, this desire to reconcile to what it means to have life after death is a desire to be reconciled to the divine and to feel that there is something that we are living out here in this world that is more than just corporeal existence, but is where the soul encounters something um, in, the, in the realm of absolute existence. And that's where we're going here with um, this mystical meditation. By the power of the hidden name, I am that I am. And by the dew of desire and blessing, the dead will live again. I am is the power of your name in concealment. The one who knows its mystery dwells in eternity's instant. Over the world it pours forth abundance and favor, and on it all worlds and on it all worlds hang like grapes in a cluster. Send the dew of blessing, the dew of grace. Renew my dispensation and grant me length of days. Bring light to my eyes with your teaching and let not the husks that surround your hosts obstruct me. May heaven and Adam's children nudge me with mercy, sustain me with their strength and fortune, but do not leave me in need of the gifts of men. So the mystical yearning here, I am that I am, Eheya Asher Eheya, God's ineffable name. It's a hidden power and it is made manifest through the dew of desire and blessing. So as I said before, rain is overt. Rain is, comes down, sometimes in buckets, sometimes like logs, but the dew is manifest very subtly. You have to look for the dew. And this is the dew of desire and blessing, the dew that you could overlook but if you follow your desire, the dew becomes stronger. And it is the dew that also showers us with blessings. It, the dew is enough to sustain the earth. And the dead will live again. So in all the ways that it, the dew that comes back is a reminder that it, there is a cycle that returns. And when we allow ourselves to follow that desire and not be um, held captive by what our rational minds might need for proof and justification, then there are possibilities of life 
that our heart most desperately wants. If, if part of what your heart desires is to have that union with the divine. And that is where this, where Yaakov HaKohen comes from. When he says, I am is the power of your name in concealment. The, and one who knows its mystery dwells in eternity's instant. So part of what Triathametim gives us, the, the resurrection, is that there is something of an always, that quality of the divine that is an always is present with the, the possibilities of life, even when we thought that life wasn't possible, is this eternity's instant, the nitzchiyut, the, the eternity that becomes possible, and again, paradoxically, in an instant, um, as we search for God, whose promises are often hard for us to understand, but whose name invites us into that process of desire. And then it, it says, um, send the dew of blessing, the dew of grace, renew my dispensation and grant me length of days. In a sense, the desire for the, for the resurrection, for the promise of eternal life is really about wanting this life to be life. Because just like we can wonder about life after death, we can also be concerned about death in life and the ways that we can not live our lives because we're too distracted by doing something else and not embracing the life that is. I think that that is one more paradox that happens here in wanting a length of days, in wanting this life to be alive, which is ultimately the abundance that flows to us with God's promises. So we ask for mercy. We want God's gifts. Unlike Choni, we can't demand them. We can humble ourselves. We can open ourselves. We can try to be aware of the concealed divine who is and the possibilities of connecting, of finding the revival that happens in that union that is a taste of eternal life. We can taste that life, even in this life, to reassure ourselves that we are participating in something that is meaningful and is eternal. And when we know that that is true in our lives today, I think it can give us some hope that it will be true in whatever happens after we die. That that spark coming from the divine is available to us. Just as it has been available here, it will always be available. So I want to end with a poem, Twilight After Hang by Jane Kenyon. Yes, long shadows go out from the bales, and yes, the soul must part from the body. What else could it do? The men sprawl near the baler, too tired to leave the field. They talk and smoke, and the tips of their cigarettes blaze like small roses in the night air. It arrived and settled among them before they were aware. The moon comes to count the bales, and the dispossessed, whippoorwill, whippoorwill, sings from the dusty stubble. These things happen. The soul's bliss and suffering are bound together like the grasses. The last sweet exhalations of Timothy and Vetch go out with the song of the bird. The ravaged field grows wet with dew. I want to point you in particular to this line, the soul's bliss and suffering are bound together like the grasses. For me, there's an echo here of Isaiah, which we read in Shabbat Nachamu, Graf, grass withers, flowers fade, but the word of our God is always fulfilled. So we see in the natural world, the withering and the fading, and we see the resurrection with the dew, the coming back to life. The rain and the dew are reminders of our vulnerability and the gifts that, that sustain us. We encounter the spiritual narratives that are embedded in nature. And if we allow our reasoning mind to turn off a little bit to embrace what we witness, we might see 
an encounter with life after death. We might sense the presence of someone who's died coming to be with us, a glimpse of the soul, a little glimpse into what is often concealed, but the God who beckons us and says, life is abundant, life is possible, even in death. Rabbi Andelman. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you want to stop screen sharing. Oh, yeah. Um, it just strikes me with, with um, you know, what you were just adding with do. Rain we can usually see when it's falling down, um, and do you often don't see right away. Sometimes it depends on how you're standing or how the light is hitting things. Um, so it's sort of, it, to me, it connects with what you're what you're saying, just sort of ha having having a faith that there's um, having a faith in, in in resurrection, whatever that may mean. That, like even when you don't see it, it's just sort of remembering it's it's there. Yeah, and I, I think that in an earlier phase of my journey with this, I needed something to tell me so that I, because I didn't want to be pretending. And I think that in the in the work that I do and in the journeying that I've done, I don't feel that I'm pretending. I don't, it, I am not necessarily all that far away from where I was, but I feel that it's okay to allow this to be part of my world. It's an inheritance that I can claim. So I'm just pulling from some of the questions. Do you, do you think that when, um, I'm thinking about all this, you know, as you know, I'm, I'm still within the first year since my father passed away. So I, all, all of these phrases that I've said to other people so many times, you know, may their memory be a blessing or, you know, may their legacy live on in you, um, you know, I'm sort of in, encountering for the first time what those things actually might mean. Do you think that those phrases are, is that part of what you're saying or is that is that um, kind of smaller than what you mean? No, it's not smaller. Um, we know that we all have different ways of, our brains work in different ways. So for some of us, a more metaphorical understanding of how death happens, even life happens even after death is a comfort. And um, there are many people who will teach about may his memory be for a blessing being the ways in which through the memory, somebody remains alive. And that's very powerful. And I think it, it, opens the sphere of belief to many people who would be challenged by what I'm talking about. I, I brought this because I think it is challenging. Um, and I think it's all connected, the ways in which we acknowledge the presence of somebody who has died beyond their death. So any way that we do it works for me. Thank you. So the um, another very popular topic in the chat um, and the questions that people send in for you have to do with the connection between body and soul, which which wasn't directly your topic, but you may have more insight into that than a lot of us. So if you're open to entertaining some of those questions, um, so. <clears throat> um, one person, I'll just read you a few because they're, they're all connected. One person asked if you could comment on the custom of opening the window when a person dies to let the soul out. Um, one person also talked about studies of near death stories and studies of near death experiences, um, and the various things we hear about about them. But one person, um, one 
what this person wrote was that, you know, we hear about um, most of the people felt time expand and an overwhelming feeling of love. Um, and someone also asked about, you talked about the soul lingering and someone asked, can the soul leave before the body does? Um, this person shared that when their own mother was dying, they had an image of her, of her soul leaving her body a few hours before her body, before her body succumbed. I don't know if you want to comment on any of that. Yeah. Um, I believe very much in paying attention to what we are experiencing. And so for the person who wrote that your mother's soul left the body early, I think we know things. That's part of that mystical orientation of the, the way that God invites us into the mystery. And um, I've been humbled by witnessing things that I never could have imagined. So I trust in that experience. Um, I have heard lots of people testify about experiences of light and heading away from this world and coming back. And it's so mysterious. So all I know is we have to pay attention to the experiences that people share with us that we ourselves have. And I think for some people, I was with a woman recently who was talking about this and she thought it was miraculous that she was brought back into life and felt that she was being a gift for more time in this world, having really been aware that she had been on the cusp of being pulled out. And I am sure that that will shape the time that she has ahead. So it's not just an experience that's interesting to talk about, but it also has a real impact on what it is to get up in the morning and say, this is the life I've been given. And what am I going to do with it? And we talked a little bit about um, about good people suffering, um, but I, so someone did raise the question of the Holocaust, and I think it's worth, I think it's worth giving voice to, right? There's the, um, can we, is there some way that we can think about resurrection, um, you know, with, um, with mass murder on that scale and, and just all of the people whose lives were ended? Yeah, well, I, th I think that the Holocaust can make it feel very difficult to say anything about faith. Um, and I want to be careful not to jump over that and say more than I can say. Um, But I'll tell you a story. Um, my mother-in-law died on Sukkot and we're now going through her apartment. And I came across a letter that my father-in-law wrote um, 35 years ago. And in it, he described both of his parents being killed and that his children, both of his parents were killed, one um, in Buchenwald and the other um, at a train station on the way to Sobibor. And he gave his children, my husband, Jonathan, and his sister, Anna, he gave them his parents' names. And in this letter, he wrote about how they carry the life of their grandparents, the knowledge of what happened to them, they carry it with them every day. And I know that for him, 
having those children and calling them by the names of his parents was a resurrection. And in that sense, every day they wake up is a resurrection. There are so many people who died and we don't have people named for them, but we have to be part of the resurrection. Do I hope that there is life for them beyond being murdered? Yes. But I wouldn't offer that as a solve for the suffering that they endured. I think that's the part of me that, that resisted moving in the direction of affirming this faith, didn't want to make anything simple. So believing in the possibilities of life, even with tragic death, can bring comfort, but we can't run away from the sorrow that is there with the death as well. So there's a hope that comes with it, but a reality of the loss. And when we're talking about the Holocaust, We have to be profoundly respectful of what it means that so many people suffered unspeakable suffering. And we come after them. So just like Abraham and Sarah are our ancestors, everyone who died in the Holocaust, they are our ancestors too. And we have to hold with great care what it means to inherit a world in which they lived and died. Thank you so much. You, um, you reminded me of a letter that, um, that was shared with me. There, at my synagogue, there's a children's choir. That's kind of the pride and joy of our synagogue. Um, and a member who has since passed away, um, who's entire family, you know, immediate and extended family was, was wiped out in the Holocaust. He sent, um, he sent a letter after a concert of the kids choir to the directors of the choir um, about how seeing their faces and hearing their voices made him think about all of his siblings and cousins um, who perished as children. And, and it made him imagine them proclaiming the eternity of our people, wherever they are in the heavens. Never got over that one. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for teaching us. This was um, profound, Rabbi Springer, as always. And there's so much gratitude to you in the chat. Really, thank I'm, you so much. I'm sorry about the chaos at the beginning. And thank you for sticking with us. Um, and, um, I hope that it's helpful in some way. Someone said it was worth the wait. I, I heartily agree. Thank, <laughs> you. Thank you again for teaching us. Thanks to everyone for joining. Uh, people are even applauding. We don't get that so often. <laughs> um, the, the last session of this series is next week. Um, our Chancellor Emeritus um, Arnold Eisen will be teaching. His session is called Jewish Theology in America today and tomorrow. And we'll be looking at um, recent developments and how we how we think about God, where we've come from, where we're going, um, theologically speaking, and, and kind of share some of his own theological reflections in the age of COVID. And we are hard at work on our summer series. We will keep you posted. Um, in the meantime, hope everyone has a good week and hope to see you again next week. And thank you once again, Rabbi Springer.